Hey, welcome back, members. Um, lovely that we are a diamond wedding. So we'll just crack on the business and get through. I can appreciate we've all got a meeting with police at three o'clock, so <laughs> we'll try and get through. Um, so moving on to agenda item nine, Council Strategic Plan for 2022 to 27, pages 145 to 184 on your paper. And I'll ask Ian Tuff to take us through. Thanks, Deputy Provost, and uh, good afternoon, members. So, uh, delighted to present to members today to full council the strategic plan for the next five years. Uh, the the intention of the previous council was always that we would have a new iteration of our strategic direction. And in February of last year, the previous council agreed that we would come back to this meeting today, 29th of June, with the proposals for that five year plan. So what is presented to you today and what is in your papers is the detail of it, but I'll take maybe five minutes just with a couple of slides to highlight some of the, the key issues. Uh, so in fulfilling that decision of Council back in February, we, we bring to you what we, we see as the Council's plan for the next five years. This is a high level plan. Uh, it sets out our aspirations, our ambitions for the next five years. And importantly, it's been informed by our communities and informed by the, the other uh, strategic frameworks that the Council already has in place for some time. Uh, uh, since February, there's been a significant amount of work in preparing this uh, strategic plan for presentation today. So I'm really grateful and I'll just take a moment to thank all the stakeholders who have contributed to the discussion over the last uh, few months. So that's everything from, committee, uh, from communities, from our partners, from our workforce, to our council management team uh, uh, and also more recently I've had the opportunity to talk to a number of members in detail around about the proposals within the plan. So as I said it's the, the high level plan, it's the right time for us to bring it, clearly uh, the, the tenure for the next council with uh, just having had the elections for the next five years as, as your, your own uh, period of, of office begins and to see us through it until 2027. So, as I said, it, uh, it builds on the rest of the Council's strategic framework that we've had in place for some time. So, some of the members returning will be familiar then clearly with the Community Plan Review Supplement that was uh, updated in 2021-22. And that's the latest iteration of the Council's Community Plan objectives and priorities. So, our Community Plan is a 15-year plan. And that sets out our overall strategic direction, along with our partners for the delivery of services and for the achievement of outcomes for our communities. It also, though, builds on the work that we've done more recently over the last three years, and that's contained within the Council's pandemic response, recovery and renewal plan. So much of what you'll see in the proposals for the strategic plan is also set out and is built on the, those uh, key priorities that were identified through the pandemic recovery, renewal and response work. And lastly, uh, if I can get the right button, uh, the, lastly, the, the, the final uh, key element of our strategic framework is the transformation strategy and that journey of transformation that the Council has been on for the last 10 years. The image on the screen is of our face principles and values and that very much underpinned that transformation work which has set us on that really positive and successful journey over the last 10 years. So as I said, the strategic plan that is now proposed builds on all three of those strategic framework elements. And, and looking at the strategic plan, though, we also looked at what are the current national influences on our strategic direction for the next five years. So clearly, we can't do that without looking at those national influences. And that is everything from the Scottish Government's programme for government that was published last year, the resource spending review that the finance minister uh, launched and published uh, very recently, I think it was at the end of May again, and we'll talk more about just the financial position of the Council going forward. We also look clearly at the national influence, influences driven by the economy and the cost of living increases, about public sector reform, and we've heard a number of uh, commentators already speak about the health and social care agenda, but also alongside that, uh, an, another part of public sector reform coming our way in the very near future is the education reform, and that's in the back of the Professor Muir work that was again published very recently. 
I've touched on the pandemic. Clearly, that national influence of the pandemic is still with us. We are still in response mode in, in a number of areas, but we are looking to continue with that recovery and renewal work as part of the strategic plan. And then lastly, the national influence around the climate change agenda. It was only six months ago when COP26 was just up the road in Glasgow, and we have since developed our new climate change strategy and our commitment to net zero. But it's not just national influences. Clearly, there are local influences on our strategic thinking as well. So that strategic intent uh, built around our revenue budget, which Joe has presented to Council last February. Our capital investment, which has our, our ambitions and our, our uh, values round about the investment in our housing stock, in our estate and in, in our infrastructure. As I said, we have our community plan. Two of the strategic priorities within our community plan are maximising the Ayrshire growth deal and maximising the caring for Ayrshire change programme. So the size and scale of the ambition and investment from both of those key pan Ayrshire initiatives will also inform our local uh, strategic plan. And lastly, our community power. And community power is about harnessing and, and embracing and building on the work that we have so successfully developed with communities, but taking that to the next level and looking at where we have got opportunities for further place-based working, for building on our participatory budgeting approaches, and for building on our work we do in localities as well. So the strategic plan, which is attached as an appendix to the cover report within your papers, uh, sets out six themes, which are drawn from a lot of those influences I've talked about there. So, uh, and I wouldn't intend to go through each of these in great detail, but I will highlight a couple of points. So, in particular, the first theme is around about building a fairer economy. And you will see within here that we have priorities around about maximising the growth deal, supporting local business, promoting community wealth building and fair work, promoting employment and training programmes. And again, the Council has committed significant investment in, specifically in those programmes from the last budget uh, process. Strengthening community-led regeneration, that's our town centres particularly, and investing in new sustainable transport infrastructure. The second theme that we identify is around tackling poverty and inequality. And again, we've talked about some of that today when Marion was pre presenting the Chief Social Work Officer report, but it's understanding the impact of the pandemic on poverty and inequalities. In a lot of cases, the impact of the pandemic has made those inequalities worse. It's about supporting the most affected by the cost of living increases, developing high quality new social housing, our commitment round about community food options, which was so successful during our response to the worst of the pandemic, about delivering healthy, sustainable, locally sourced food within our schools and promoting digital inclusion and, in, and participation in addressing some of those issues of poverty and inequality. The third theme around about improving community wellbeing. Again, very much uh, part of this was, was raised earlier in our earlier discussions, but also builds on the, the uh, health and social care strategic priority, the, the wellbeing community plan, delivery plan. And, and it's about strengthening place-based approaches to service delivery, addressing the impact of inequalities on health and wellbeing, developing self-management approaches to mental health, Progressing partnership action on social isolation and loneliness, again, something that's very close to members' hearts, clearly. And also, as I mentioned earlier, maximising the Caring for Ayrshire change programme and the impact it can have on our communities. The fourth area is around about supporting children and young people, promoting the rights of children and young people, delivering high quality early learning and childcare, developing new multidisciplinary community facing services tackling the poverty-related attainment gap, supporting the young people's guarantee. And it was so good to hear Marion talk so passionately about keeping the promise. And that's clearly why that's within our strategic plan as well. So you can see the connections between what you've heard before today and what you will see in the, the strategic plan going forward. Our fifth area is around about delivering a clean green East Ayrshire. As I, I mentioned, we have our a climate change strategy now in place, very much informed by by the support and work of the Children and Young People's Cabinet and other stakeholders in developing those priorities. So within that, you'll see their commitments to delivering on the net zero emissions targets that we've set, about tackling fuel poverty and driving forward green recovery, 
about promoting active travel, managing waste sustainably and promoting green networks and infrastructure. And the last of the six themes that we have is around securing financial sustainability. Joe's already touched on the work that started around our new financial strategy, and that will come back as a complementary piece of work to the strategic plan. And as I said, that, as Joe said, that will come back to Council after the summer recess. It's about improving service delivery through innovation and uh, redesign. Leading the development of community power, as I mentioned about participatory budgeting and place-based working. Responding to those very large and significant uh, public sector reform agendas that we now know about. Implementing our workforce plan, implementing our capital investment plan. And importantly, assessing the impact of all of our policies and strategies. Uh, and we do that through our equality impact assessment. So just in closing, I thought I'd just touch on really what the next stages are now for, for our strategic plan. So we are looking at continuing that conversation, that discussion with our stakeholders, with our communities, with elected members particularly, about promoting further engagement and awareness raising, developing that detailed action plan. And the discussions I've had with elected members and other stakeholders recently, and clearly uh, uh, people are interested in what sits behind those high level aspirations. And that's very much what we will come back to council with in that detailed action plan. That action plan will contain our commitments to work streams, to activities, to tasks that uh, uh, chief officers, the council management team and other colleagues will be taking forward. So the detail of how we will deliver the community uh, the strategic plan will be brought back to elected members for, for further approval after the summer recess. And alongside that, we have uh, a commitment to the implementation and assessment of all of this work. So uh, that, that model of the PDSA model of plan, do, study, act is very much what drives this. So we've got clearly our outline for the plan. We will be studying that through our introduction of a new programme management office that will support the work of the strategic plan, that will support uh, the, the project leads and the, the key sponsors for the work streams, and that will allow us to assess and adjust where we need to and bring back those iterations if required. So with those uh, introductory comments, uh, uh, Deputy Provost, happy to take any questions. The recommendations are set out on page 145 at paragraph two. Thanks. Mashanine, thanks very much. Uh, immense amount of work across a very vast amount of area. So go on yourself. Um, I'll open up to the floor, Leader. Thanks, Ian, uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, you know, I think this is, takes that decision that we made earlier. That brings us forward, and hopefully, we can carry forward some of these. Uh, take some of these plans into action, action plans to, to tackle some of the main issues that we've got. And my goodness, we've got huge issues in terms of uh, the cost, in terms of well-being and cost of living crisis, and uh, probably more so than most of local authorities. Uh, but in terms of place making, you mentioned that as well, and, and uh, localities. I mean, that was one of the ambitions that I'd maybe stated at the, the first council that uh, we would we'd look to improve local de decision making. And, you know, I'd like to see a paper coming as early as possible, if not the first cabinet, within the first couple of cabinets after the recess, just to, to have a pathway in the way forward and how we uh, improve better local decision making and, and uh, some of the kind of and how we can improve localities. And, you know, I would, I would ask that we, we, we do that with the support of members. And also, perhaps, I think that one of the biggest, perhaps separately from that, I think the cost of living crisis is something, you know, as we, we, we face rising inflation and uh, energy prices, and we know that we're, many folk in our communities are really struggling. Uh, similarly, we'd like to get, you know, an action plan, you know, taking how we, we, we tackle the cost of living crisis and the, the, the wellbeing agenda, because we know that they're, they're both are interlinked in, in terms of the, the, the big issues that we've got with health at the moment. And I would ask that an early, an early paper be brought to Cabinet in terms of that as well, because uh, I think we've really got to prioritise these within the, 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 the broader strategy. But uh, I, I think in terms of, if I could pick these out from that, just as a matter of we need to deal with these things as a matter of urgency. And I, I would ask that we could address them and uh, say to members that, that would be one thing that I would be looking for the cabinet to do fairly early on in the, the news uh, after the recess. 
thanks, Councillor and uh, uh, Deputy Provost. So, okay, I'll re respond to a couple of those points, and I think Katie will maybe come in on the placemaking. Uh, as I said, we're looking to create that detail that sits behind those high-level ambitions and aspirations that we've got in the, the strategic plan. A lot of that will be around the action planning for cost of living crisis and the wellbeing agenda that you touch on. So, so we would, we would, that's certainly the commitment I'll give today that we are looking to do that, to put the detail around about some of those high-level aspirations that we've got. The placemaking, the community power stuff, it absolutely is, is, is a priority for us again. And I know that the officers are already starting to look at how that will be shaped and how we can engage with elected members again on that too. Katie, do you want to supplement that? Thanks. Thanks, Ian, through you, Chair. Yeah, thanks very much for that. And I had spoken to, to the leader about this, that um, Councillor Filson now has a role for this in terms of the, the Cabinet and in terms of localities and, and place. And we are, you know, we've been looking um, over the last few weeks, probably the last few months, about how we take this to the next level. And so we're working on some um, um, information over the summer, looking at good practice elsewhere, learning from practice locally like 9CC that we heard about earlier on today to look to see how we move this to the to the next level and we hope to bring a paper very soon into the new term of you know first couple of cabinets and just to outline the scope of that and to see how we can take it forward and I think that the, the community power part is actually touches on everything that Marion said earlier and around inequalities around the economy around work around wealth building and actually ultimately the community are the people that all of us in this chamber serve so it's about actually how we make sure that we flip um, away from maybe, you know, you know, making something more prescribed and really go deeply into what people need and want from us and how we can engage them and how they can be part of that as well. So it is an exciting piece of work and I'm happy to bring that back absolutely within the context of the plan because it doesn't stand alone. I think the idea is to pull these threads together. So I can assure members that we're, I've had touch base with Councillor Filson and some officers. I will say that the meeting was meant to be today at one o'clock, so I'll not be progressing at that far the day. But um, we will be taking it far, and you'll all be deeply involved in that. So I don't expect to bring a fait accompli. I would like to engage with all of you in terms of how you think this should go. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Councillor Maitland, then Councillor Robson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Ian. Um, this is actually um, it's about the cost of living crisis and really moves on from what the um, leader was saying earlier and how we really need to get a report back soon. But I would like to see us go to our 13 food larders. I'm sure you will be to see what input they can give us between the heating and the eating, because um, anecdotally uh, it's going back up again after levelling off, certainly in the community. The one I know best is levelling off. It's going back up again and that we'll be fully supporting them. It's very sad in this country. We are neither short of food nor fuel, but our people are. So I'd really like to see the food provision, especially the food larders, come in. Thank you very much. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Councillor, thanks for that. Uh, and yeah, that will certainly be part of the work we'll be taking forward. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Very important. Uh, Councillor Filson. Thanks, Chair. Just on top of what uh, Katie was saying there, I'm hoping to the next two or three months get round about most of the councillors and spend a wee bit of time in their communities and just to get a wee feedback from there. And we'll take that back to one meetings. OK, thank you. Thanks, Drew. Uh, Councillor Kevin. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the presentation, Ian. Really excited to hear some of this stuff um, and look forward to you taking it to the next level. Uh, Joe mentioned earlier as a bit of a geek for finances, well I'm a bit of a geek for community involvement and community power, so um, I'll definitely be chapping at your doors. Um, so often you see these strategic plans and they end up documents on somebody's shelf in an office, um, but I get the impression that's not the direction of travel here, so really, really excited about this stuff. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, Councillor Cogley. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and Ian, thank you very much for the report. Um, as you know, I do have some concerns about it, and which I'll uh, take some time to run through. Firstly, in relation to the language, and I'm referring first of all to paragraph two, uh, Roman numeral nine, in which we say, note the implementation and delivery of a strategic plan is underpinned by a programme management office and benefits realisation approach. Now, at a high level, yes, I can get that and I'm inspired by it. 
But if I started using that sort of wording and phraseology when I'm out in my communities, I know people would just say, you know, what are you talking about? You've been in London Road. You come back into your community and we'll, 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 we'll knock that out of you. And it's very alienating and it makes us appear as though we are an ivory tower. And it does make us seem that we are not in reality with what is going on on the ground. So I wish to flag a concern in relation to that and the use of our language and how we how we communicate. Um, moving on to the priorities, the six list of priorities, and there are six um, here that are, they're all familiar themes. Um, and I, I, I think what I'm most interested in, um, I understand the main headings, I understand the the, the sort of generic terminology that we use in relation to each of them. But what I'm trying to understand is what, how is this going to change things actually on the ground? What is this actually going to do in my more deprived areas within my wards? Because I am genuinely very concerned about that. I think that there are some overarching things that we can do that we can do differently. And I would suggest as an overarching general approach, we, sh we should be following a theme which is a back to basics or get it right first time. Um, and looking at some of the very, very basic ways in which we carry out our procedures and the, the ways in which we provide our services, because I think we're getting some stuff wrong that we don't need to get wrong. I think a part of that is down to service, to, to, to staffing levels. And we know we're facing recruitment shortages in many, many different areas. And I think we need to be upfront with, with our constituents and rather than responding later and after the event and when we've already hit a catastrophe, we need to be upfront and saying we've got a problem here. And as elected members, we can actually do quite a lot to help um, because we are in touch with areas within our communities where there is perhaps a resource that has, has hitherto been potentially untapped. And I think that we really need to be addressing that. The two things are linked, getting it right first time and staff recruitment. Um, going on to it, the, the six priorities, and I could talk about each of them in detail for a long time. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to pick up on a couple of items. So um, in reference to the green item, delivering a clean green East Ayrshire. Um, during the course of the, 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 the last um, term, we spent a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of resources into developing a litter in schools uh, programme, amongst other things. And I'm quite horrified to find that it's not included or referred to. And on, <clears throat> excuse me, on, on attending the first climate change group meeting, unless I had pushed for it, it wouldn't have been included. Now, this is, is a programme that has the capacity to have a big impact in our communities. It can be modified to be used for other different generic groups within our communities. Yet, if I hadn't intervened here and asked for it to be pushed, and I'm still facing a block wall here, it would have been binned. And that's a waste of money. It's a waste of resource. And we shouldn't be in that position. Um, back on the same theme, delivering a clean, green East Ayrshire. We, we know we have a lot to do as far as climate change is concerned, but we're not getting some of the basics right. And we know that something like up to 50% of our households aren't recycling properly. And these are some of the very basic matters that we need to be addressing straight away. Um, and then perhaps going for the higher vision stuff later. Um, one other point that I would like to bring up now that I would like to be the subject matter of any forward forward strategy is uh, private landlord housing nets. The regulatory framework that supports this is very poor and it lets us down, it lets our communities down. And during the autumn, I will be proposing a motion to council in which we look at this. And I, I would like to see that included as part of a strategic as part of the strategic plan going forward. It actually taps into each of those six areas, because if we can improve the standard of our private lets, that impacts on so many people and so many of our, our communities. Um, I'm struggling with this strategy because I would like to see more detail before I'm able to endorse it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Kingsley Cogley. Um. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, so, uh, and also, Councillor Colley, thanks for the time we spent, and, and yeah, yeah, it was 
productive, I think, having yes. some time out with the formal council meeting to talk through some of those issues. So, so clearly some of them will sit within services to deal with and, and in terms of how they will actually uh, you know, have activities, actions in place to address some of those points. That will be, as I said, the next iteration in the action plan that we'll bring forward. So a lot of those six key themes and the, the issues that sit below that, some of that will come back and, and I'll probably in the hands of other colleagues around the table about the detail of, of some of that, if others uh, do want to come in. But but certainly, listen, we, we have that commitment around about, uh, and sorry, sorry, your first point was around about the PMO and the language that, that we use to describe that. So within the body of the report, okay, that recommendation talks about that language, but actually within the, the actual, the, the body of the report and within the strategy itself, we have tried to describe that a wee bit more. So so it's a, a point well made round about the headline language that we use and, and when we're doing further engagement, I'm happy to reflect on that, absolutely. But so we have tried to describe that in a wee bit more detail in both the covering report and the strategy itself. But I, I take the point, about using that council speak, and I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm very guilty of it, so I apologise now. But that's why we've got colleagues and comms that help us with that sort of stuff. So, so our commitment to do that. Uh, you, you, you talked about the staff shortages, etc. And, and uh, yeah, again, I maybe defer to other colleagues who are, are you know, managing that just now, and, and if they want to contribute uh, something to that discussion, fair enough. But I do think again that is part of that implementation stage. The next iteration of the strategic plan will be about implementation. So, so others hopefully will will satisfy your your curiosity, your questions around about that, and, and hopefully that will be able to be picked up with you directly. Uh, certainly, uh, yeah, the, the clean green airshare uh, was chosen deliberately as one of the, the themes because we have that climate change strategy in place now. We have that commitment. We have those high level aspirations in there. If there are parts in there that we, we think we need to develop again, we will look at that over the next few weeks as we develop the next stage of this and happy to do that. And I know that uh, uh, colleagues are, are, are already looking at how to implement the high level strategic plan or the strategic intent rather around about the, cl the climate change strategy. Uh, so and on and on the the issue of private housing let landlords again we'll take that away I, I mean unless other colleagues want to come in on that today but again it's it's probably within that category I think of some of the detail that supports that high level aspiration so so not many answers there for you but a commitment to to make sure that those are contained within the next stages of the work thank you uh, appreciated Ian and Chief Executive would like thanks Deputy Provost. I suppose for me it's about emphasising that this isn't the service improvement plans, this isn't the community plan, this is the council strategic plan. So what we're asking for today is an endorsement from you as the council, as the elected members, what the important things are over the next five years, that then we as officers and through the service improvement plans, and we'll draw them together. You know, as Councillor Cordley says, there'll be different bits about children and different service improvement plans. How do we draw that together and make sure it's making an impact? How can we see that if these are the things that you say is important, for this council, that we across all our services draw that together and actually deliver against it. Because sometimes it's quite hard to actually, and as that terminology benefits realisation, you've got a lot of activity, but what's the actual outcome and benefit of that? Some of the language, you know, comes actually down through our external audits, actually, and we'd be a number of times our auditors had actually spoke to us about program management offices and benefits realisations and actually criticised us because they couldn't clearly see, you know, where we were doing that and drawing it together. So, so it is language that's, that's alien to, to many of us, not just the communities, but actually our audience for some of that is also audience, you know, making sure our auditors can actually see what we're doing. So this isn't the delivery plans. Delivery is out there through our services and our services will work together in themes to actually deliver this. The strategic plan is about the elected members, it's about the council giving us as officers that, that direction, that saying, here are the important things for this council, this is what you know, we intend to do over the next five years, and therefore go away out there and work in these things, and for the services then to draw that you know, to, together through here. So, so that's it's just the difference about, there's not the detail here, but there's no intended to be the detail here. It's about, this is about what the strategic direction of this council is for the next five years. Thank you. 
Are you all right with that, Councillor Cogley, just now? Yeah, OK. Um, there's a few people wanting in. I'll take Councillor Mahan on the screen, Lillian Jones, and then Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Dave Provost. Uh, just picking up on the priorities in the, the six priorities. Uh, so I, I think the Chief Executive and Katie, uh, Maureen and myself, we attended uh, the launch of the Ayrshire Growth Deal and the Community Wealth Building Commission. Uh, and it was really inspiring and inspirational and some great speakers among that. And I think to tackle the five of our priorities, we've got to get you in right at the very start. And that's building a fairer economy. And to build that fairer economy, we know where that wealth lies. It's got to lie within the communities. To build that fair economy, and we see some of the social enterprises and the examples that have been set out in the conference yesterday around about ownership, uh, the, the the social enterprises have been set up, and the people that are actually working them and setting up, and I was astonished to hear 60% of people with learning disabilities were part of a major operation that was set up in Spain and delivering within their communities as management buyouts. So it was really inspirational. So I think to get the five priorities we need to look at the first one and I know that's a strategy and it's a, it's a five-year strategy but I think we need to start on that and through the bit the, the, after the back of the issue road to all the thing and that commission we had potential there to kick in and move it forward and uh, <laughs> it would be remiss me not to talk about uh, clean green environment and without stealing on the national company's logos every little helps and I'm going to look around about me today again I see we're reverted back to papers uh, so, uh, and as part of our digital strategy and programme, I would love to see us going back to that strategy where we, we sit with our laptops and feed into that strategy as well. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, Councillor Jones on the screen. Sorry, I didn't see you. I've not got my specs from the day. Um, so. Are you maybe on mute, Lillian? Beg your pardon. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Um, Eddie, I hear what you're saying about the strategy and it's all about listening to what our communities are wanting and then for the council to go back and build on the strategies to help deliver on the priorities. But when I'm reading my papers, I actually don't see what my communities are telling me reflected within the papers. So if I take you to the improving community wellbeing, and I look at the first bullet point, sorry, that's page 172. And if I look at the first bullet point, it's mental health and addiction. And that's a very good priority. And if we deal with that, then we help community wellbeing. And that's fantastic. But then when I take you to page 174, it gives me the fourth bullet point, and it's address the stigma and discrimination faced by people in recovery from addiction, including alcohol, gum, and drug use. And that's also a very good priority to have. But what's missing there for me in my communities is addictions have some really severe and serious impacts on our communities. And what they're telling me is that we need to do more to support people with addictions and who are also our tenants to be able to integrate and settle within the community. And also we should be supporting them to build relationships within that community. And I think if we can do that, then we will improve mental health and addiction and we will help to reduce the stigma towards people with addictions. I don't think we're doing that very well, but I'm, I would say I'm pretty well based in all of my communities and go to all the, the committee meetings. And this is what they're telling me. So if this is what we are saying, what we heard from our communities, I would like to know, who within our communities are telling me this and who is it that we're not reaching? Because clearly the groups that I'm going to are telling me something more and different to what we've got in these papers. So on that basis, I it, it's disappointing. Um, and so I, I've just been interested in some comments um, on that, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, thanks, Councillor Jones. Uh, so those uh, those references in the strategic plan, some of which are 
are picked up, and I think I mentioned this in my introductory comments with the slides as well. Was you know it's built on what is contained within other strategic documents. So what is in the health and social care strategic plan? What is in the community well-being or the well-being delivery plan as well? So so I, just to reassure you that you know that there will be action sitting behind them already because they are established plans already. So again, colleagues within health and social care and and other partners as well, not just the the council, but they will be addressing them. So uh, perhaps it's just in the, the presentation of it in the paperwork today, Councillor Jones, it's, that's maybe not apparent, but again, just to reassure you that, that that's certainly the case within within those other strategic plans that, that there are commitments to deliver those, you know, with with officers working on that. And I think, uh, if, uh, yeah, that, that would certainly be my, my uh, take on that one. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Jones. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Helene. Um, Councillor Mackay. Thank you very much, Deputy Provost. Uh, <clears throat> may I say at the outset that I'm very interested and very interested in everything that everybody has had to say. I think <clears throat> the Chief Executive indicated at an earlier point that it was important that the Council had its own strategic plan. And that's certainly something that I absolutely endorse. And I think it's the fact that we haven't had that as highlighted as that has been a gap. And I'm very positive that we are about to look to fill that gap. I accept completely what Councillor Cogley has had to say about language. Uh, in terms of how we are actually presenting ourselves in relation to the general public. However, here is where I'm going to come at variance to that, and that is I do actually, I'm delighted that what we are planning to do with our future strategic plan is adopt a, a programme management office and have benefits realisation approach. And I think when we look wider at some of the funding and how that funding, external funding that we actually bring in is actually assessed, one of my concerns has been for many years that we are able to do one project at a time and we need to be more ambitious than that. And to be able to have that ambition realised, then I think it is correct to adopt a programme management office and also then to be clear about what the benefits realisations actually are in terms of was it worth doing? Is it something that we would like to replicate? What has our learning actually been? And to have something that captures that and to have people designated and able to do that and support officers who already, as we have heard and are accepting, I think, as a, a council, are really, really hard pushed and will continue to be more hard pushed going forward is something that I am certainly supportive of. I think that the points that Deputy Chief Executive has made in relation to communities and the engagement that we have with our communities is absolutely something that is significant and something that is important. Again, something that I would endorse. I do think that the pandemic has changed our communities and in some ways there are really positive benefits that are coming out of that. I know and I can identify within my own ward and within my own particular experience that the fact that almost we were not there has meant that there has had to be community resilience grow up because people had to find and experience their own ways of actually supporting each other and making change throughout the pandemic. And I think that's something that the work that we take forward has to acknowledge and has to build on. And I think that will be positive and very much reflects the new world that we face or find ourselves in post-pandemic. <clears throat> I think what I am hearing is, again, a real desire to ensure that we are making 
wider use of engagement with our communities. I would very strongly like us to be able to do that and perhaps expand up the network of people that we have uh, access to, who actually are our consultees, if you like, against decisions that we make as a council. So I would hope that some further work could be done on that. And again, I'm sure the fact that we are a new council, that we have new elected members who will have perhaps new connections with our wards at the moment, we will each be able to make suggestions of further groups that could be added to our lists of consultees. And I think that will only strengthen any approach that we take forward going forward here. So having said that, and having said that I consider that there is a lot of positive here, I am also hearing quite strongly <clears throat> that what members are looking for is to ensure that they and our communities understand more about what the actual detail is about what it is that we are actually planning to do. We know that as a council and authority, we have been proud and we have taken actions specifically against child poverty, tackling poverty overall. I think what we now need to look at is, OK, so against the backdrop that we find ourselves in now, what is the actual detail about what it is that we are going to do that is going to be different from what we have had in the past? Because again, remember, a definition of madness is doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome from it. So we have to absolutely be doing something different. And to be able to endorse a strategic plan, I would put forward that we need that level of detail. Detail. So at this stage, I am not ruling out an acceptance of this. I am asking that what we look for at the moment is that we are asked on points one to four to note what is actually, this is on page 145, to actually note what we have. I would <coughs> seek to move that at point five, that we note the Council's strategic plan as attached, as an appendix to the report, etc., all of the way down, and then add the following. And that is that we defer approving the proposals until details are brought forward to the next Council. Again, <clears throat> when we look at point seven, remit officers to develop a detailed action plan for approval by that council. And again, at point eight, to agree to receive, and perhaps annual is not sufficient. So again, I would ask that that was changed to regular progress updates on the delivery of the action plan, because it may be that we are in a fast changing environment and it may be that things change and council would want to be informed of that and be able to respond to that, those changes perhaps more regularly than on an annual basis. So <clears throat> on that basis, I would then be seeking to move those changes, Deputy Provost, as an amendment to the recommendations that are set before us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mark. Um, Chief Executive would like to come in. Thanks. I just I mean, of course, to, to members, you know, uh, to, 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 to do that, but, you know, what Councillor Mackay, you know, uh, uh, is saying, you know, that the difference between approve and note, I think what we're looking for is officers to clearly you can see the detail there that we're going to come back with the action plans. We're looking for the steer that these are the right areas to come back with action plans on. There's no much point in us going away and developing really detailed action plans around a range of things and then saying, well, that's not what we wanted you to focus on. So while it's noting, you know, like I would also, you know, be wanting to say that, that 
whether we use words endorsed, but actually these are the six areas that we'll go away and do work on and then bring back the action plans. That's really what we're trying to say here. We're looking for that steer, that approval for you as members, that this is what we're working on and we are committed here. Whether it comes to council or cabinet, I'm open to that, you know, in, in terms of that, and again, that will be up to, to members and bringing it back more regular again. But it might be we have a very detailed one and we get a steer of members about what areas, maybe some of the priority areas you say to us, you know, like the child poverty action plan or whatever that we bring back, might be the particular focus you, you can you, you can bring back. The high level bit for me today is actually to get that steer for members that as a council, these are the areas that are important for us, for us as officers to go away, then work on and bring back to you. Councillor Mackay. I hear that chief executive and I anticipated that that's what he would come back to us with. I think in normal circumstances, I would accept what you're saying. However, I think there is such concern in terms of what is contained within the action plans and to actually look at that, that we really do want before we even endorse an overall plan to have that background information. So that is what I am sticking with as an amendment, please. Leader. Thanks. Uh, I, I think in terms of what the recommendations are written down, I, I would agree to move the to change in terms of the uh, recommendation eight. I mean, we'd have regular updates as well as an annual progress report, so we could we could match the two of them together because I would hope there'd be regular updates anyway. I think that the, the six key areas uh, when Jim was referring to the two ones that he was thinking about, it was important. I was thinking there was two other ones that were in my book were important, but I think we would conclude that I think the, the six key areas that are identified are the areas that I would like to see action being taken in now. And I, I don't want to see any kind of delays on it. Uh, and, you know, I think we can we can come back with updates. It's not tremendously, I understand where more is coming from, but I think to give a broad steer and particularly with the work of what you do in terms of localities and placemaking and in terms of tackling uh, cost of living crisis and uh, I think we might make haste in that, and uh, I think the framework we've got there, I would, I would be minded to approve that today. But give regular updates, and if we want to change them, you know, but have the flexibility there within. If, if should, should, uh, should members be concerned? But I think just to give a clear steer today, I would, I would, I would stick to the recommendation five. But uh, I would, in terms of alter the. Uh, recommendation as Maureen is requesting for reg you would include regular uh, regular updates as well as an annual report. Thanks, Leader. Um, uh, Councillor McFadgen's waiting online, so I'll bring you in, Councillor McFadgen. Uh, for the sake of waiting, you know, over the holidays for one more council period to get a bit more detail, if you know what I mean, on the back of what Councillor Mackay said and what Councillor Collins has been saying and our own discussions within our group, I think I'd be minded to support the amendment and, you know, I, I'd like a bit more detail too. I mean, I don't want to hold things up, but I don't think necessarily adding some more details in is going to hold things up terribly anyway, but it gives us a better picture to work from. So I'd be inclined to uh, support the amendment. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor McFadgen. Uh, I'll bring in David Mitchell. I suppose, strictly speaking, uh, all of this is within the gift of Council. There is no statutory or external provisions around the requirement, any requirement for or the content or the preparation of the process around the strategic plan. So the good news is it's in the gift of Council. If what sits behind the concerns being expressed that inform the amendment is the fact that by Council approving the strategic plan, and if the concern is that the recommendations would then allow the detail to be worked up and approved elsewhere, uh, then perhaps the solution is, because I do think it's important going back to the Chief Exec's remarks, because if Council today doesn't agree the six themes, it's actually incumbent in Council to give the Chief Exec and colleague officers a steer on what they should be. 
If Council does agree the six themes today and is interested and keen to see the detailed action plans that will sit behind and been around the delivery of those six themes, then it should actually be incumbent in Council to put their hand to support the themes. If the concern is that's Council signing away at the strategic level and not having sight of over the detail, then is the solution perhaps not to bring the action plans back to Council? But the quid pro quo would be Council approved the strategic plan today, subject to the action plans coming back to Council for approval. They can still go to Cabinet if that's the desire, and Cabinet can make recommendations to Council. But if the actual concern of members is signing off on anything before you see the detail, is the solution not to bring the detail back to Council? That's just a thought. Thanks, David. Uh, Maureen, would you like to go ahead with your... Um, I'll bring you in. Certainly, David, I think it is important that the plans do come forward and are signed off by Council, so I would certainly accept that. But I think to have that as a whole suite of documents, and again, we have seen that happen in the past, I think that's what I am asking for on this occasion. Uh, OK, so with your amendment, um, do you have a seconder? Yeah, I was willing to second the amendment. It would be again, and may I also say then to pick up on what David has said, and that is to remit officers to develop a detailed action plan within the proposed uh, strategic plan and report to, and it would be council, and again here, Ian, to just give me a steer, we had discussed whether that would be to the August Council or September Council. So is it possible to put to Council in August and September 2022? That's at point seven. So, so I was checking when the, the next Council was, that's, that's so the delay in my, my was answers. August, was August. Next council is August, and then there is a further council on the 25th of September, I think. So, yeah, that's my understanding. There's a council in September. I'm not sure if there's one in August, David, I think perhaps. 15th, August. Right. 15th, is it? Right, OK. Uh, in the normal form, a word would simply be to bring it back to the, the to a, an er, a, a, as early as possible future meeting of council to okay. give sufficient flexibility. Just, just, can I just clarify then, Councillor Mackay, that you're still moving the amendment to reduce approve to note the strategic plan and yes. have the action plans come back to council? Yes, yes thank okay. you. Thank you. OK, thank you. Does anybody move the original recommendations as stands? Leader. Move the original recommendations, but I'll concede to the, the, the Maureen's, but I'll agree to the uh, recommendation in terms of an annual report plus uh, regular regular updates. Um, uh, and a second there for you. Councillor McMahon, super. Um, is anybody online want to come in? Sorry. OK, so we've got a motion by Councillor Douglas Reid, amendment by Councillor Maureen Mackay, and we'll go to... Uh, sorry, David. Sorry, to be ten, no, sorry, Deputy Provost, this is just a technicality. I think it's who the, the motion's actually by Councillor Mackay because it was seconded first by Councillor McFadden. Apologies, but it's just for the minute and clarity in the vote. Uh, that's important. Uh, so the motion by Councillor Mackay, seconded by Councillor McFadden, is per the recommendations in front of members at page 145, but to amend, approve in recommendation 5, Roman numeral 5, to note the plan. Uh, to amend at uh, 7 now, uh, the reference to the plans uh, reporting to Cabinet September, October, that that should also include uh, reporting back to as early as possible future meeting of Cabinet uh, Council, and uh, which doesn't negate it going to Cabinet and Cabinet making recommendations to Council in accordance with Schema Dales. And at 8, I think it's been accepted anyway, so that one, but for the record, is to amend annual progress updates to, to more regular, as long, along with 
with the annual report and that's not in contention that's also in the motion uh, in terms of uh, the amendment to recommendation eight so that's the motion the amendment is per the recommendations but accepting the amendment of recommendation eight from annual progress to regular updates and an annual report so the, that's the motion and the amendment and I hope that's clear because we're on teams arrangements it would now be a roll call vote deputy provost uh, through yourself Councillor Douglas go for it thank you deputy provost just to confirm obviously myself and the provost have not been in attendance for most of this item I take it we would be uh, unable to vote or are we able to vote because we're now back in the chamber of just just for clarity thanks any restrictions around voting where members haven't heard or been involved in the whole discussion is usually in the context of quasi-judicial. Certainly all advice and the provisions of the Code of Conduct relate to planning or licensing matters where if you aren't in for the whole hearing, it's not best advice to put your hand up at the end of it. Uh, obviously, this is a, a policy item. It's an open discussion. Uh, it's a matter of individual judgment for members, whether they, they've uh, understood enough to vote or not, but there are no similar restrictions because it's policy not quasi-judicial uh, so the code of conduct would have no bearing here on uh, members participating uh, not having heard or had the benefit of the full discussion okay cool um david thanks for keeping us right as always um great so motion by maureen mckay and amendment by council douglas street uh, we'll go to a roll call vote okay Thank you, Provost. Um, members, when you hear your name, could you call for the motion or for the amendment, please? Provost Todd. Amendment. Councillor Canning. Amendment. Councillor Friel. Amendment. Councillor McFadgen. Uh, motion. Councillor McGee. Councillor Cowan. Amendment. Councillor Mackay. A motion. Councillor Richardson. Amendment. Councillor Adams. For the motion. Councillor Jones. Motion. Councillor Linton. Councillor Reid. Councillor Barton. Amendment. Councillor Boyd. Motion. Councillor Douglas. Motion. Councillor Ingram. Amendment. Councillor Maitland. Amendment. Councillor Clark. Amendment. Councillor Cogley. Motion. Councillor McGregor. Motion. Deputy Provost Leach. Amendment. Councillor Lennox. Amendment. Councillor Simmons. Motion. Councillor Crawford. Motion. Councillor Kyle. Motion. Councillor McMahon. Amendment, please. Councillor Watts. Motion. Councillor Filson. Amendment. Councillor Hogg. Amendment, please. And Councillor Stewart for the motion. Just to confirm then, members, that the outcome of the vote was uh, 16 votes in favour of the amendment and 14 votes in favour of the motion. Uh, the amendment, therefore, is duly carried. Uh, thank you, members. Councillor Reid, Councillor Mackay. Um, we'll move on now to item 10, East Ayrshire Leisure Trust Review of Governance Arrangements, and that's pages 185 to 411 in your papers. And um, we'll bring Annika Freeland. Hi. 
Thank you, Deputy Provost, and I apologise for the length of this paper. Um, I am really pleased to bring this paper to you. It's a review of um, some of our key documents, uh, um, which are fundamental to the governance and management of the Social Leisure Trust. The background to this is we have been in existence now since 2013, so we're nearing 10 years, and these documents were all produced prior to moving to, to trust. Um, so it is time for us to re review those. There's been significant changes in the Leisure Trust over that period of time in terms of our structures, but also in terms of our vision and how we deliver our services. So it is time to do this, this piece of work. Um, during the 10 years, Oscar has also reviewed all arm's length organisations. So again, it is, it's prudent for us to take on board their recommendations and review those and integrate them into our documents. We have also worked really closely with internal audit in the review of all of our, our, our practices and our governance arrangements. And so again, this piece of work integrates a lot of the recommendations from um, a lot of work with internal audit. So the first one is our constitution, which is available in the members portal. This was approved by the Leisure Trust Board last night and is for noting. Um, it's fairly minor amendments to the constitution. Most of them are to reflect the organisation and how we've developed over the last uh, nine and a half years. And it is also to incorporate the, the Oscar recommendations as well. The second piece is the service level agreement, which is for approval and is Appendix 1 to the paper. This is a really large document, but it's really important because it underpins the, the relationship between the trust and the council and the services we offer and the support that we, we get in return. So the main updates to this are the, to reflect the changes in both the trust and the council in the last 10 years in terms of structure, but also in terms of what we offer. The previous agreement between the trust and the council uh, was made up of five separate documents. So as you can imagine, there's an awful lot of duplication between um, throughout the documents. So what we've done this time round is amalgamate them into one to take out some of the duplication um, across the five agreements. We've also included for the first time a new performance framework. This isn't just about KPIs and SPIs, which clearly are very important, and we'll report those as, as normal through those, but it's also to include um, qualitative assessment of our work. What impact are we having on people, not just how many people are coming through the door. So this is really important to us. It doesn't matter if we get 10,000 or 10 people, it's the impact that we're having. And so our performance framework is now part of this, this agreement too. In addition to that, there is now a mechanical services agreement. Um, we have a fleet and we have lots of equipment and this is now, it used to sit very separately from the five agreements, so this has now been incorporated into this. Um, the, the lease of um, the lease of the assets or the buildings has been updated to become an asset agreement. And what we've done differently in this, this one is we've clearly outlined the roles and responsibilities of everybody who has an interest in each of the venues. Um, we, have, we manage a lot of the venues on behalf of the council, so we need to detail the roles and responsibilities that both the council and the trust have. But we also share our facilities with other partners. And so it's important that everybody is aware of the roles and responsibilities of the venues. So the asset agreement has been updated to include that and that piece of work has been done in partnership with facility and property management in particular. So those are the changes to the service level agreement. It's a very large document, it's a very important document, it underpins say, our relationship but it also makes sure that we deliver um, on all aspects of our work to the community in a strong way that's constantly monitored and reviewed. The next piece of work, which again is on the members portal, is the collection development strategy. This was approved by the Board of Trustees in February of this year. This is the first time that we've ever established a vision for our collections. Other than our staff and our buildings, the collections are the most valuable item that we manage on behalf of the Council. Um, I'm sure you've all seen a lot of our collection or, or know a lot about our collection, but we felt it's really important that we develop a vision for, for the collection. So it's a 10 year plan. It's very much aligned to our leisure facility strategy. Some of the key things in the collection development strategy is we really like to repatriate the collections back into communities. We hold a lot of things in stores that are actually really important local history and heritage to our communities. So we want to work, work with local community groups and get them back into the communities so that there's better access to them. These tend to be our lower value items, but nonetheless, we still need to make sure that the, the environment that they're housed in is appropriate um, whilst we get better access for the community. On top of that, we're conscious that we've got over 130,000 items in the collection and we need to provide better access to all of that. So we're doing a number of things to do that. 
digitisation. We're now working on a strong digitisation programme for the collections. Um, and we are redeveloping our future museum website. So that provide online access to the collections, but there's nothing better than actually seeing the collections in person. So we will be working with colleagues in the council to create an open store in a venue somewhere in East Ayrshire that will allow us to, to create arranged access to the collection so that everybody can see what we've got and learn from what we've got and, and, and value it the way that we do. The collection development strategy also is another um, couple of priorities, um, housekeeping being one of them. As I said, we've got over 130,000 items. A lot of those items have come from house clearances that are not necessarily part, shouldn't necessarily be part of a collection, but are important to local community. So one of the exercises we'll be doing over the next couple of years is housekeeping and finding the most appropriate route for, for those items. But we also are conscious that we do have outside Edinburgh and Glasgow, one of the most important collections in the country, but we don't want to stop at that. So we've identified priorities for future collecting as well. Um, it is very important, the collection. We do have accreditation in all of our museums and we do have significance on two of our collection items, that are our Burns collection and our Dean Castle musical instrument collection. And we want to build on the collections that we have. The final part, again, related to the collection, the final document we've reviewed, um, very important document is the collection procedural manual. This is a document that, allow, that makes sure that we have robust um, processes in place for the management of the collection I've just described. The 130,000 items that are very valuable, both to our communities, but also from a monetary point of view. So we need to make sure that we have sound practices in place to do that. So again, we've been working very closely with colleagues in internal audit and finance and legal to make sure that we have the best systems in place. Um, we work closely with collection trusts and we've adopted the, the collection trust spectrum standards. That's the UK standards that all museums, accredited museums use. All accredited museums must use nine of those um, procedures which are outlined in the paper. You won't get accreditation for your museum unless you adopt those nine uh, procedures. However, we believe because of the extent of our collection and the value of our collection that we want to adopt all of the spectrum standards. So the new collection procedural manual does that. Um, and these are outlined, all of the um, procedures are outlined from paragraph 16 of the report. So as I said, this is a, a, an important piece of work for us. Um, there's no finance implications to this piece of work or HR, although it is um, it's also realised that there needs to be a dedicated resource both within the trust and with internal audit to make sure that these pieces of work are continually monitored. Um, since we've done the work on the collections in particular, internal audit has carried out further checks on us, some testing on us, significant testing on, on the collections themselves, and it's been found to be sound, so our, our procedures are good. Um, so what I'm asking you to do today is to note our constitution, to approve the several service level agreement, to note the collection development strategy and to approve the collection procedural manual. Thank you. Annika, thank you so much for that. What an immense amount of work. Um, but thank you for bringing that to us today. Councillor Maitland. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Annika. And um, as you said, the, the second point in the recommendations is really the most important. Although it doesn't have financial implications, without it, we can't deliver to our communities. So um, last night at the Leisure Trust, all councillors um, agreed to put forward the we recommend item two to you. And I think it's very important that we if you get a chance to look at the service level agreement, it might sound like a die dry document. It's not half as interesting, I have to say, as the collections piece. But um, if everyone, I would like to recommend item two. Thank you very much. And thank you, Annika, for all your work over the last year. Ah, thank you so much, Councillor Maitland, absolutely. Councillor Mackay. Thank you very much. And again, thank you, Annika, for the work that you do and for what you have brought forward here. Uh, <clears throat> I think what you have presented for us in terms of the collection procedural manual. Uh, when we hear about what has happened in other places, I think it is particularly welcome that we have such a safe pair of hands uh, really looking at what the collections are that are owned by East Ayrshire and therefore owned by each and every resident within East Ayrshire. Really welcome that. And again, there have been in the past, our collections are 
truly wonderful things. There have been opportunities for members in the past, which I hope can be re-looked at again, to actually get behind scenes in the museum and actually see quite the extensive store of our collections. Uh, I would commend all members to take the opportunity to visit that if that tour is able to be re uh, replaced again, Annika. It really is quite impressive and I uh, particularly welcome that you have a strategy to keep updating that collection and acquiring new pieces because I think that is the only way that we will keep ourselves at that national place that we actually hold and I think is something that is of real value to East Ayrshire. So again, thank you for that. Thanks, Councillor Mackay, and it really is incredible the amount of, you know, things we have here in East Ayrshire are historical. Um, absolutely fantastic. Councillor Boyd. Thank you, Chair. Um, I attended my first Leisure Trust meeting last night and just like to say well done to Annika and the presentation all the work she's done as well. Um, being a bit of a historian myself, um, collections, yeah, totally agree if we can get better access. I think um, is it something like less than 10% of what's in the Dick Institute can be displayed? And I know there's really valuable paintings at uh, Old Kilmarnock, I think, Waterloo Street there. Um, also, you know, where would be, just to maybe look to the future, where would the museum space be? Um, when I was doing some of my heritage work with the schools, I was sorry at the time they didn't value museums shut. You know, that was a valuable resource as well. So it's important to have it out through all of East Ayrshire. And it's really interesting, there's 130,000 items there. So I actually donated something a few years ago um, when I was away travelling. I visited Volgograd, that's actually Stalingrad in World War II, and I donated that item. So you never know in the future, you might see something I donated. It was an actual war helmet, um, so I just donated it. I wasn't too comfortable with, with it in my house. So a lot of the public have donated items, and it'd be great for them to be seen you know, in catalogues. So no, just well done to Annick and her team. Thanks. Ah, oh, that's brilliant. Graham, absolutely fantastic. Would anybody else like to come in? Councillor Filson. Thanks, David Provost. Uh, just on the Dune Valley uh, Museum, uh, Graham mentioned there, uh, when it was turned into an exhibition centre, a lot of the good artefacts and, and treasures were taken away to the Bears Institute. I know we're working on the Dune Valley Master Plan, and if it does come to fruition again, with the museum, that we can actually bring the things back to the village. I'd like you to look at that, Annika. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Phyllis. And then absolutely all of that, all of those items are at the Beard Institute, as you rightly pointed out. We're, we're really keen that we look at the feasibility of reopening Dune Valley Museum and getting those pieces out. But it's not just, as I said, the Dune Valley collection. We would like to look at repatriation of a lot of our community assets, uh, collection pieces into community assets. We're working um, in Stewarton to see how we can develop a heritage centre with the local community and local history group there. We're doing the same across Irvine Valley. We're really keen that we get local collections into local spaces. Councillor McMahon. Uh, just picking up on what, what Druid said, run over there to, I know I'll get it from my community council when it's at the community council meetings and whatnot, the, the stuff that's lying in the deck that potentially could come back to bear the body come down to come up. So yeah, I'm absolutely delighted to hear that, Annika, that some of the stuff where it can be, can be brought back to come up. Definitely. Councillor Reid. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Deputy Provost. I'm, I'm tempted to ask Councillor Boyd, was it one of Hitler's or one of Stalin's helmets at there? It was actually, it was quite funny, I was just, if you want to hear, it was a, one of the German uh, Wehrmacht helmets, so I bought it and then as I said, I wasn't too comfortable with it in the house, so I donated it to the collection. And, and my, my, ser my serious point, I, I, th uh, thanks Graham, uh, I think that bringing the collection in, into the other other venues and can I maybe put, may pay particular thanks to uh, the, the assistance you gave with Kilmarnock Football Club including a bit of, another bit of silverware, the Ayrshire Charities Cup, which is now part of that collection, which you've loaned to the football club, and the help that you gave uh, to the, the, the volunteers that were, some of your staff were out helping, help them pay, pre present, uh, you know, some of the artefacts that the uh, football club have, have got, and that's another, uh, another reason to visit Rugby Park. So, uh, but I think this, the whole idea of, of bringing collections out in the open, and I remember, I think it was Bill Costley, who's a, a big, uh, you know, art, art uh, fan, you know, and the, the, went down with him to the basement for the first time at the Dick Institute and saw the amount of 
uh, paintings up there just gathering stir, and it's great to see some of that coming coming out there. Hopefully, no, no, maybe no. But uh, <laughs> no, they're no gathering stir, she's saying. They're no gathering. They're self. Uh, they're, well, controlled uh, environment. Yeah, they're the words you're looking for. But just the general principle of people getting access to it, I think it's a great thing and, and allowing others to do so and, and sharing the good and glory. I think that's been really good. And just uh, thank you for all your efforts, eh, Annika. Uh, thanks for that, Leader. Provis. Thanks very much, Deputy Provis. Can I just pass on uh, my thanks to Annika and the team? A wee anecdote uh, with a visitation from America a few years ago, a lovely family, and their great great uncle was a Provost of Kilmarnock Borough. And your staff, Annika, found the actual portrait of that provost. And uh, we managed to get the family in and the, the woman was crying when they got the portrait out. So well done to the staff. Well done that you're keeping all that stuff safe because the portrait looked great. And uh, that my family went away back and told everybody in America and they sent me the message back. So these things are important. And uh, it's great that the team's looking after uh, all of our treasures. Thank you. Ah, lovely memory, lovely story. Anybody else like to come in? And you all agree with the recommendations. Super. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, so moving on to item 11, Ayrshire Roads Line Service Plan 2223, pages 412 to 455 in your papers, and I'll bring Kevin Bride within. Thank you, uh, Deputy Provost um, members. Um, the purpose of this report is to present to Council Ayrshire Roads Alliance Service Plan for 22-23 and to note the performance for 21-22. There is no doubt 21-22 continued to be a challenging year for the service and at the same time offering support to other services through waste collection and setting up traffic management at testing and vaccination centres across both networks as we were presented with periods of lockdown. However, we managed to deliver the majority of capital works acro across both our networks with parking income being the most challenging element of the service as lockdown, change in behaviour and travel restrictions were imposed. We were able to carry out capital projects from external funders and delivered spaces for people in school streets projects as a direct result of COVID and proposed rolling out school streets across the networks as per the Cabinet report in February. We engaged heavily in the STPR2 process and provided comment to the draft document and await publication in the autumn. We continued our partnership with the Improvement Service to deliver the Scottish Road Workers National Training Programme and lead on the management of this with 15 authority partners. We continue to provide secretariat to the A77, A75 core and subgroups and are supporting South Ayrshire Council, Dumfries and Galloway and Mid East Antrim on an economic impact assessment of the aforementioned national roads. We commenced the construction of the new Cumnock flood defences and are currently engaged in the local flood risk management plan in partnership with South Ayrshire Council, North Ayrshire Council, SEPA and Scottish Water. And we presented our parking proposals to Cabinet and continue to develop proposals to, to demolish the multi-storey car park. We engaged with Scottish Futures Trust and Transport Scotland and will be bringing reports to Cabinet on our proposed private-public partnerships for EV charging. In 21-22, we collected two national awards for our Winter Resilience Partnership, recognised by UK Highways and APSE. We are recognised for our areas of good practice in that we continue to use WDM's Scheme Builder and the risk-based approach to defects, therefore decreasing our insurance liabilities, and are finalising the introduction of artificial intelligence for survey work on our network with potential revenue savings and improved targeting of our network for surfacing. We have improved use of our social media platforms and updated our website, introduced a monthly digital newsletter to employees and have created the members portal. We are finalising the digitalisation of our timesheet process and the traffic regulation uh, order process. Our programme of works have commenced for 22-23 and to date we have not had any difficulties in resources as a result of COVID. However, we are continuing to experience some supply issues with precast concrete products high value electrical equipment and lighting columns due to copper and steel shortages and the continuous price increases of fuel and bituminous products. This will require close monitoring of our programmes and spend profile. In support of road improvement, in support of road improvements, funding from the Strategic Timber Transport Scheme has been received for 2020 for 2023 with funding of 148,000 only awarded to South Asia. We made representation to the Timber Transport Forum and have been advised the funding is available 
During this financial year, the bids for East Ayrshire will be reconsidered. We are continuing with our LED programme. Further progress has been made in a number of transport projects. An agreement has been reached for necessary to roll grant funding provision into the new financial year to complete the remaining projects. The focus of these projects will continue to be improve improvements to our roads and infrastru infrastructure to improve journeys and increase safety measures where required. Active travel stra strategies were also approved by both authorities. I'm pleased to confirm that our overall budget for East Ayrshire, including grants, is just over 22 million, with a total budget across both networks of 36.7 million. To date, savings of 7.464 million have been realised, providing the framework for achieving the 8.634 million target by 2023. As we move through 22-23, we will continue to engage with the STPR2 process, Transport Scotland and our partners such as Scottish Water and SEPA and support the levelling up fund applications for transport across both networks and support the Ayrshire growth deal we required. Our transformation is complete within ARA to streamline the service to provide an improved service to members and their communities with the emphasis on active travel, carbon reduction, workforce planning with recruitment being finalised, digitalisation, income generation, community projects and engagement, and support for training through the modern apprenticeship schemes, foundation apprenticeships and our graduate programme. We are a recognised training provider uh, by the Institute, Institution of Civil Engineers and have partnerships with Air College, Glasgow Kelvin and UWS Paisley Campus and will continue to support STEM through our local schools promoting civil engineering and in particular attracting females to the industry. Our project management will have a greater focus on being pan Ayrshire through a combined programme to improve resource allocation, cost and time delivery. I also carried out a significant review of our transport fleet services and we are beginning to see an improved service to our customers and significant improvements in working practices within the workshop. We experienced an average winter with some sub-zero temperatures during the months of February and the combined figures for winter 21-22 across both East, Air East Ayrshire and South Ayrshire have been collated and will be reported to Joint Committee after recess. Our community resilience groups are now numbering 160 and we will continue to encourage communities to expand this to flood watch, particularly in Darville. The RCI for East Ayrshire Council continues to improve with a reported figure of 33.8, which I'm delighted to report has moved our ranking from 22nd in Scotland to 18th, which is a reflection in the capital investment made in our network. And I thank members for this. We are also currently fourth in Scotland for uh, the condition of our A-class roads. Details are provided on the specific activities to be undertaken over the coming year within Appendix 1. We will provide joint committee with detailed updates on our action plan and strategic priorities to ensure members are fully cited in progress. The performance scorecard for 21-22 is presented in Appendix 2. And finally, I can, I can confirm that the service plan was approved by joint committee on the 10th of June and presented to South Asia Council earlier today for noting. The recommendations are contained in paragraph 2. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Kevin. As you say, we, we know you've been in South Ayrshire the day. You only have half said some words. <laughs> so thanks for being here with, with us this afternoon. Uh, I'll open it to the floor with any questions or comments from members. Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Deputy Provost. <clears throat> Thank you, Kevin, for that report. Uh, the common theme of listening to the day was how important our communities are, access to our towns and the problems with transport. There was a notice of motion went up to the Council on the 27th of June 2019. You can give us a report how far we've got done with that regarding municipal transport. Through you, Deputy. Deputy Provost, um, Councillor Crawford, um, I've I've had a meeting with SPT, and there is a proposal that SPT come along to brief um, cabinet or council and joint committee in both uh, um, authorities regarding municipal buses. Um, the way forward is possibly a franchise arrangement. Uh, and that's something that SPT can provide us with more details on. So th that that's the plan after recess that we bring SPT along to council um, to do a presentation on municipal bus services. Thank you, Deputy Provost. 
Thanks for that, Deputy Tory. It's just it's been three years. That's great. Uh, thanks, Kevin. I'm sure we all look forward to that. Um, MD else, any questions or comments? Councillor McMahon. Thanks, David. I promise. Uh, Kevin, mine is on the projects and on the the, the link road for air to the M74, which is the A70, and some of the improvements of the remarkable improvements run about Glenbuck. That's where we're going with that run about now the low bridge uh, coil, uh, drawing in Sorico Hall, and the proposal for what was the bypass that well, I was understanding that was meant to be put forward for as part of a levelling up fund. Through you. Deputy Provost and um, Councillor McMahon, um, Belfield Interchange is the is the transport bid for East Ayrshire, which I'll be taking through uh, to the Leveling Up Fund. Uh, in terms of the A70, um, we would be taking that at another round of the Leveling Up Fund. Um, it has to be a joint project between East Ayrshire and South Ayrshire to to get the the level of of investment that we need. Um, the bridge at Coal Hall would require to be to be raised, um, and there would be the proposal would be to have a, a, a bypass at Oakletree. Um, a lot of the work is already done, um, and we have it ready so that if there is the set, the third round of the levelling up fund, we would be we would be ready to put in a, a bid. Thank you, Debbie Brovost. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, there's a few folk like then I'll just take them in order as I'm getting them. Provost. Thanks, Deputy Provost. Uh, Kevin, this just arose just yesterday, and it was somebody complaining about, I, I call them, to this will affect everybody, I, I, I would imagine. I, I call them Tobies. It's the, the water covers on roads, whether they're six inches square or a, a, a metre square. And the reporting pro uh, process is you get the postcode for the nearest house and you send that to Scottish Water, that's fine. But if you don't know what the postcode is, it's very difficult to find it. So my proposal is uh, maybe your team could go away and look at it, is use the, the three-name metre square app that's in the country. And I don't know if you could supply us, uh, councillors, with that application and how to use it. And that way, um, if we find a... a a drain that's sunk in the road and cars are getting over and causing mayhem. Um, we can find out exactly that square metre for that uh, problem and that could be relayed to Scottish Water and get a far quicker resolution for that. I, 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 I'm putting you on the spot, but if you could go away, your team and have a look at that and maybe come back to us with, with a report to see if it's feasible to do it. Through you, Deputy Provost. Uh, Provost, y yes, I can. I can go away and have a look at that. It, it might be that we use our WDM system um, rather than um, what three words. Um, however, I'll, I'll go away and have a look at it and uh, see what we can come up with. Thank you. Smashing. Thanks, Councillor Boyd. Thank you again. Um, Belfield Interchange was just mentioned there. Um, on that, I looked at the presentation. Really good. It makes sense given what we've got there, the third lane, etc. Just a wee point to note, the outside lane floods a lot when it rains. So just to note that. And also, I had a, a kind of frozen presentation and looked at the footbridge. The footbridge looks as if it's coming out in the Belfield Park. It's too far away. But I did email the officer who made a really good presentation at the time and he said that could be moved. I just think it needs to go slightly north, maybe from Rickerton Road to the Queen's Drive, because... If it goes the route it's planned, people will take that alternative underpass that was mentioned at Cabinet. And I went down there and had a wee look at it. It's not suitable for people to go down there at all, you know. Um, it would flood. So we really need the footbridge to be just to make sure it's uh, closer to the roundabout. Other than that, the plan looks really, really good with the lightings and the three lanes, etc. And just a final point, uh, I know the Victoria Bridge has been sorted, but traffic within Comarlet Town Centre is pretty poor at times. It's kind of jamming up with various issues, you know, and it's something we might need to look at in the long term, the one-way system, etc. You know, I'm picking up a lot of complaints about that. Thanks. Thank you. Th through you, uh, Deputy Provost. In the Belfield interchange, there is a uh, mitigation uh, within the design to, to, to tackle the flooding around uh, the junction. 
and in terms of the bridge location, um, that location is indicative as part of the presentation, and we're not at the stage of detailed design, so um, that can be moved um, as as we go through that detailed design process. Um, the Victoria Bridge um, is is open now, and yeah, there there was um, some um, holdups within the town. Um, and I'm quite happy to look at um, the, the traffic moving around the town as, as part of uh, the wider uh, Kilmarnock um, master plan. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thanks, Kevin. That, OK, OK, that's great. Um, I'm just going to take uh, members, as, uh, as I've seen their hands, if that's OK. Um, Councillor McFadgen on the screen. Hello, Kevin. Thank you very much for a report that was very informative. Um, I wondered if you'd be able to get like a report or an update for the where we got to with the road from Fennick and Stewart and so the people from Stewart can access the M77 more safely, uh, whether or not it came to the four ward councils or all the councils, but you know, some kind of updated report and uh, you know, idea of a way forward where we're going on that project would be very grateful. Thank, thank you very much. Through, through you, Deputy Provost, yes, I, I can do that for the, the B778, um, Councillor McFadgen. Um, we have a consultant on board and they're actually working on detailed design for that project now. Thank you. But I can bring forward some details and, and set up a meeting with the, the, the ward members. Thanks, Kevin. Councillor Clark. Hi, um, Hedgehogs, we've been approached in the valley by people that want road signs up warning drivers to watch out for hedgehogs. Um, have you any plans to put those signs up? Through you, Through you Deputy, Deputy Provost, Provost um, we, we won't be putting up um, signs for, for, for small um, animals. Um, what we will do is we will put a, a, a caution a triangle up and have um, a plate identifying what a uh, breed of animal it is. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that and thank you, Deputy. Thank you. Councillor Filson. Thanks, Deputy Provost. Kevin, I kind of like to go away without mentioning my one I've been mentioning for the past six years is the B741, the cloth in slip between Dome and Newcomer. But I'm glad to see we're making progress now. We're just waiting on landowners' permissions and then we can move on with that. It's going to be a three months shut down, so that'll cause a bit of havoc, but I'm glad it's getting there. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jones. You may be on mute. Sorry, Deputy Provost. <laughs> so, Kevin, it's just to ask, Command up Road and Cross House, when the upgrade to the footways, um, a program for and um, just just to make it easier for the wheelchair users that live in the village, they're finding it pretty difficult, especially the manual wheelchairs. Um, through you, Deputy Provost, yeah, I, I, I can get uh, officers to look at the locations for wheelchairs. I, I assume this is drop curves you're referring to, Councillor? Yes, Kevin. Yeah, we spoke yeah. about it earlier in, when you met me in Cross House before. Thanks. Yeah, through you, uh, Deputy Provost, we have a programme of, of drop care, so uh, I'll, I'll pick that up with the officers uh, uh, that are involved with it. Super, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Are we all okay with the recommendations? Excellent, thank you. Um, so that's us at the end of business. However, as you may be aware, we do have an emergency resolution um, to bring to council today. Just for the benefit of new members, I'll just read you out our um, time limit of speeches. So the mover of a motion or amendment shall not speak for more than 10 minutes. Any succeeding speaker will not speak for more than five minutes. And the mover of the original motion should have the right to speak for five minutes and reply. This is a motion brought forward by the SNP group and I'll pass to Councillor David Richardson. Thank you, Deputy Provost. The motion is, this council totally rejects the inhumane Westminster policy of forcing refugees to Rwanda. And this council will write to the Foreign Secretary 
and asks that this policy be withdrawn. I know it's been a, a long day, everybody, but uh, this, uh, this issue is uh, really getting to me just now. And I just want to maybe speak for not 10 minutes, or maybe just a few minutes, as to why uh, at local council level it maybe links into things that we've discussed today. Uh, just two points. Firstly, economically. Across the UK and across Scotland and in East Ayrshire, we have an ageing population. We're going to need young people or younger people working, paying taxes and paying national insurance to cover the costs of those old people's pensions and their care in later life. Um, we currently don't have enough babies being born, basically, and we currently have a lot of people uh, reaching retirement age and, be age and beyond. Where are those people going to come from? So the main issue is that Scotland and the UK needs immigration. Now, when I see in the news, the national news, um, people that are uh, fleeing war-torn countries and uh, seeking asylum from persecution, being portrayed as people that are just coming to the UK because they want to live off their benefits, there's nothing makes my blood boil more than that. Because people that are coming to this country, they, they're, they're coming to make a better life for themselves. And in the main, they want to they want to work to provide that better life for themselves and their families, and we need them. We actually need them because listening to Marion McCauley, who a brilliant presentation today about East Ayrshire Social Work Services, but I don't think Marion will uh, mind me mentioning this. She came back to me with some uh, answers out with the council, and we currently have fifty posts available for people who uh, can go out into our, um, our the homes of our elderly people and look after our elderly. We know that every council in Scotland is desperate to recruit these people, but where are these people going to come from? Um, my colleague, my SNP colleague, uh, Jim McMahon, mentioned a, a brilliant statistic, which I didn't know. UK-wide, 1.3 million jobs available. So it's not as if we don't have jobs that these people can do. Um, lastly, a lot of these people are asylum seekers. They're... they're escaping war touring countries. Do we actually owe these people anything? Again, that'll be a big, big discussion. Well, UK foreign policy may have actually impacted on why these people are having to leave the countries that they're coming from. If it was down to them, ideally, they probably wouldn't want to leave the country of their birth. But when, you're, when your home's been blown up, then, and you look around and you're just looking at desolation, then maybe you, you, if you're that low, you might have to find a country, somebody else in the world that can provide you and your family um, with the chance to make a better life for yourself. So that's that's one of the reasons why I want to move this motion. And really, I would like East Ayrshire Council, not just for the council's sake, but on behalf of the residents of East Ayrshire, maybe to issue a letter to Pretty Patel to say, not in our name. Martin David, thank you. Councillor Mackay. Thank you very much. And I would want to welcome the, what Councillor Richardson has actually brought forward, and I'm very happy to second that. Thank you, Maureen. I'll open it up to the floor if anybody's got anything they want to say. Provost. Thanks, Deputy Provost. Um, and thanks to Councillor Richardson and Councillor Mackay <coughs> proposing and seconding uh, this motion. You know, it's I find it incredible as well. It's not just about uh, the, the situation that the country needs um, more workers to come in, and that's absolutely right. It's the way these people have been treated. Now, I've went on and on for years. I'm sure everybody here knows that uh, whenever I go to armed forces events, military events, I tell those officers, serving officers, that I do not support illegal wars that our country finds itself in, but I fully support our armed forces. And David has uh, alluded to the situation in Syria, Egypt, Tunisia, uh, all the way through the Middle East, where there's been outside influences and there's been promises made. Afghanistan's a perfect example where promises were made to people there. Uh, you follow uh, what we tell you to do and we'll look after you. And then when the proverbial hits the fan, we just jump out of the way and leave them to it. These are real human beings escaping from strife that wasn't their making. 
This was the rich that caused all these problems. And the analogy, the, 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 sorry, the rationale that uh, the ministers in London at Westminster are saying for the reason for this policy is we're attacking those gangs. Uh, we're making it difficult for those gangs because they'll not have a product. They won't have a product. They're reducing human beings to a product. Now, the analogy there is if the chief come down to this chamber and spoke to us and said, well, I'm going to tell those victims of crime in your communities, we're going to forcibly move them. And that will deal with the perpetrators because they'll not have a product. They'll not have something to make a victim. It's absolutely abhorrent in this day and age that we're treating people like this. And who could have came up with a policy like this in the 21st century in Western Europe? Who could have came up with a policy like this other than the far right wing? And it is disgusting that that has been allowed to happen. And it's disgusting that nobody seems to be standing up within that party and challenging this. There are a few exceptions, and I take my hat off to them, Theresa May being one. But this is terrible, and it is absolutely incumbent on everybody that's got an ounce of human dignity to challenge this policy. And uh, I hope we do that and uh, we follow the, uh, the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Councillor McGee. Hi, thanks to, to Prof. I fully support uh, the motion, but I don't think it's helpful to, to mention the jobs that we've got vacant because I think it only helps confuse the issue between an economic migrant and a refugee. Uh, supposing we had no jobs to offer folk, these folk are fleeing in terror. They're refugees and they're going to be seeking asylum. They can't seek asylum to get to the country and uh, to treat them the way they've been treated I do feel is abhorrent, but they're no economic migrants, and that only conflates two different issues. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Maggie. Councillor Maitland. Thank you, Deputy Provost. Again, it's um, actually following on from all that's been said. Post-Brexit, um, immediately post-Brexit, we lost 10% of our hospital and care staff that were foreign-born they went home because of the hostile environment. And Rwanda is just a continuation of that hostile environment. And I'd just like to point out the hostile environment and the go home was originally started by Theresa May. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maitland. Councillor Boyd. Thank you. Um, as an independent, um, I'm non-political, I'm going to keep this comment non-political here. I just want to talk briefly about my own experiences, um, just in the... Stalingrad thing. I actually went travelling 15 years ago and I spent three months in the Middle East in Iran and Syria backpacking around and then, you know, history happens when you come home, these countries all change. And, you know, people were telling me at the time, don't go there, this could happen to you, that could happen to you. It was a complete opposite. You're arriving in Aleppo, this was 2004, going off a bus, folk coming up to you, what to help you. The people in these countries were so helpful. Iran and Syria were two of the favourite countries I've been to, you know, and there's a lot of misconceptions, you know, in the media and the press, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't go there. The people in these countries are tended to find, generally in the world, most people are the same. And I, I want to help, especially, you know, people from countries like Syria, et cetera, you know, because they've helped me. So it's, it's you know, it's, you know, payback, you know, we, we need to help these people, you know, they're very friendly. And what I'm saying is there's a lot of, stereotyping out there, you know, of what happens in these countries. I've just had great experiences, particularly in these countries which have problems now, and also Ukraine as well, which is another great country experience too. Ah, thanks for your experiences there, Councillor Boyd. Thank you. Councillor McGregor. Uh, thanks, Deputy Provost. Um, just very much in the vein of um, previous speakers, uh, I think this is a, a fantastic motion and I think the voice of East Ayrshire needs to be heard from us on behalf of our constituents. When we've seen children washing up on, on beaches and people dying in the freezing articulated lorries because they're desperately looking to us to help them escape, you know, all sorts of things that we thankfully will probably never understand, um, to, to see a, a government 
um, pursuing the policies that it has towards these people, and that's what they have people um, as as just incredibly upset. And so, um, I just wanted to to put my support forward as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor McGregor. Councillor Hogg. Hi, good afternoon. I think it's incredibly disappointing in the 21st century that we're having these conversations regarding people who are the same as us and we're just fortunate for where we live. I wholly support this motion that's been brought forward by my fellow councillor. And as I say, I find it really quite incredible in the 21st century that we are actually having this conversation. It is so disappointing, isn't it? Thank you, Deputy Provost. Thank you very much, Councillor Hogg. Anybody else like to come in? No, OK. Um, yeah, again, just these stairs are showing how kindness and compassion are heart. Everybody OK with this motion? Uh, Councillor Linton. Oh, sorry, sorry. Councillor Linton's letting you in first, Councillor. Let's go for it. Um, uh, just to say, um, if it if the motion doesn't go to a vote, could I please have my name recorded as not being in favour of the motion? Thank you. No. Uh, sorry, Councillor Watts, the way it works is you would need to move an amendment and if you fail to get a seconder, you can have your dissent recorded, but you can only do so if you've moved an amendment and fail to get a seconder. That's the only circumstance in which you can have your dissent recorded in terms of the council standing orders. Are you happy to go along with the motion? Or would you like to make an amendment? To clarify, we have obviously the motion is there's been an indication of support from more than one party across the floor. And as I said there, that unless you move an alternative and fail to get a second to your alternative, you cannot otherwise record your dissent to the decision because you're offering no opposition to the decision unless you move an amendment. OK, to leave it means you're happy with the motion, no? Yes. OK, great. Councillor Linton. And that was the point I was going to make. I mean, I think there has been no dissent recorded, so it would be the unanimous decision of East Ayrshire Council that we oppose this. Is that okay? Eric, you do you thank you? Action by Westminster. I just want to make sure everybody's happy moving forward. Sorry, did you want yeah, to? Yeah, just, just leave it. Just leave it. Yeah, right, Deputy Brock, it is an important issue because there's a difference between a motion being accepted and a motion being uh, taken to and confirmed to represent the whole council. What you would have here would be a majority, I think, but without a vote. But just to clarify, in terms of standing orders relating to meetings, paragraph 24, dissent from finding, any member who has moved a motion or amendment and has failed to find a seconder may request that his or her dissent in regard to the decision in question be recorded, and that dissent will be recorded in a minute. But as I said, you would have to move an amendment, fail to find a second. If you got a second, that would go to a vote. If you didn't get a second, you could have your dissent recorded, but you can only have dissent recorded when you've tried to move an alternative to the motion and been unsuccessful in getting a second. In, the, in that instance, then, I would move an amendment to the motion uh, against accepting it. Do you have a second? I was going to, perhaps through you, Deputy Provost, the amendment is simply not to uh, agree the motion. Yeah, so that's fair enough. It's, it's, it's a direct negative, that's fair enough. So, uh, as you said, Deputy Provost, is there a seconder to the amendment? Do you have a seconder? No. OK. So, Councillor Watts, are you now wishing to have your dissent recorded, having complied with paragraph 24? Yes, please. OK, and just yourself. Yeah, OK. Are you happy for that? Are you going to go to a vote then? No, he hasn't got a second. Yeah, sorry, David, <laughs> probably. there's no second, there's no amendment, valid amendment, there's no vote, but there's one dissent recorded. OK, great. Everybody, thank you so, so kindly for this council. It's now summer. Um, <laughs> I know that, um, <laughs> albeit, <laughs> albeit that um, there's limited meetings, we're all going to be working incredibly hard within our communities and helping our constituents, and I hope you all have a nice break that you've managed to get. Um, the recording will now stop. Thank you, everybody.